Let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu Ed Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Va'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From Devarim Deuteronomy 6.4, the cornerstone of our faith. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Leolam Vaed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what's the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. Avisharecha. <laughs> And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, the Yahafto l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. One of the things that we talk about during this season of return goes back to what we say, but that goes back to what we think. And God tells us to think on these things from Philippians 4. And that will keep our hearts and minds still steadfastly locked into where they should be and be able to see God do great and mighty things that we know not of. And, you know, the place that it challenges us when we're wearied, when we're undone, when we feel worn out, God is there for us to make a difference. And so we're going to start with think on these things. When I'm worn and weary and don't know what to do, when everything around me says that I won't make it through, then I remember the simple words that you had said to me, and I rise above every challenge and walk in And you said, think on these things, think on these, yes, think on these, just think on these. We have to think on these things. and excellence think on these things think on these yes think on these just think on these be anxious 
for nothing, but in everything learn to pray. Give thanks to God in all things, so in Messiah's love you'll stay. And this peace that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind, and fear will have to flee. And he said, think on these things, think on these, just think on these, just think on these. Whatever is true, whatever is honored, whatever is right, and all that is pondered, whatever is good, with all that is excellent Think on these Just think on things on these. Think on these Yes, think on these Just think on these We've got to think on these Just think on these Think, on think on these. these Yes, think on these Just think on these. You know, when we think on these things, we can wonder really what, is it worth it sometimes? We wonder, everything seems so challenging around us. Uh, there was a passage in the book of Revelation with one of the congregations where he says, I'm rich and have need of nothing. And I thought about it and realized that this is, I, I wrote this song, In Need of Nothing, coming from the standpoint of somebody who was in that place, but then saw the hand of God move to bring them out of that place. And you know, when you look in Revelation and you look at those passages, he's not condemning them and saying they're locked into this. He said, he who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And then there's something they can do. And so this takes it from the standpoint of somebody who listened to it and was transformed and changed in need of nothing. I was rich and had need of nothing. Didn't know that I was poor Till you stretched with your hand of mercy And opened up my heart's door And freed me from the lies of the fall To heal my life forever With shame and disgrace Then you took me from my nothing To make me your something All by your power and grace And took me to a much better place Where I beheld you face to face Cause I was rich and had need of nothing Didn't know that I was poor Till you stretched with your hand of mercy, mercy. And opened up my heart's door And freed me from the lies of the fore To heal my life forever
God wants to break through no matter where you find yourself. Victory. forevermore. Only God can work in the area of forevermore. And that's a pretty good guy to have around, isn't it? I think so. We're going to conclude this portion with noonday in the night. We mentioned on Yom Kippur that that was one of the portions that was actually in there when it, Isaiah 58, where it talks about then your light will break forth like the morning, your darkness is the noonday. And God wants to break forth and bring deliverance for everyone. Look, <laughs> it seems like the only thing, I, I was watching the news the other day, and they had those women in those stretch, lime green, whatever it was, bright green, custom, beating people up in the subway. And I thought, my goodness, this looks not only dystopian, it looks like, a, you know, like a scene out of Batman. I was waiting for Batman or somebody to come in. And, you know, I thought maybe one of those people like Spider-Man or somebody, one of the guys on Broadway that are always on the streets out there, maybe they should have the real thing come through and wipe out some of these people in the subways. I don't know. It, it seems surreal. But with all the darkness and gloom all around, God wants us to be available for his light to shine to us and through us to a world that is in darkness and needs to be delivered and set free. And that's what Messiah came to do was to set us free. Noonday in the night. And things we don't yet know Still into the night With all of our might we now go Oh, into the night With darkness and fear all around And into the night Uncertain of what will be found Oh, yes, and into the night Your unfiltered light will abound and with the light of your power and grace And in the light that shines from your face Oh, into the night, filled with your light we go Yes, into the night, filled with your light we now go And the darkness has to flee As your light sets people free And everyone will shine so bright like noonday in the night, just like noonday in the night, we go to set the captives free, open the eyes that cannot see, to bring about what soon must be, like noonday in the night, we shine like noonday. Open the eyes that cannot see To bring up 
Just like noonday in the night Oh yes, and into the night Restored by your light We now go Baruch Hashem Yeah, I was thinking about that. Into the night we now go. Uh, I, I'm thinking too, you know, I mentioned before, jokingly a little bit about th the need for Batman to come on the scene and some of these things. But I was looking also that there was one incident that happened where this woman was being beaten up in the subway on her way home or whatever. And there was a point where somebody comes into the screen to try to stop him. And the guy turns and does some kind of a grunt and he runs off. You know, it's like, I don't know. You know, sometimes you get involved. He could have been stabbed to death or something, too. You don't know. But there is a a need to rise up above the fear and look to the Lord to be that light that can transform. So we have to keep all of that in mind as we move forward in all that God is doing. You know, it doesn't mean we jump into some new vigilante approach to things, but we need to be aware of what's going on and that we are in a battle and God wants to bring victory for us and for all those who are walking in darkness and have no light. Shabbat Shalom. Sabbath peace to you. We welcome everyone to Beth Zion. We're glad you're here with us today. And uh, for all those who are also joining us on the broadcast, we're glad to be in fellowship with all of you. Our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of Central Jersey. And that extends beyond New Jersey, too, sometimes, especially with this internet stuff now, we have people watching us in all of the most unusual places. So uh, it's, it's exciting when we hear from somebody who's not local, uh, who is being blessed by the work that the Lord is doing here. Uh, but our calling is to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes and know that as that truth goes forth, it sets people free. He said, Yeshua said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And when we put the message of Messiah back into its original Jewish context, and that's not to say that if people are expressing their faith in Messiah in a different context, that's fine too. But there's something about looking at the foundational structure of what God was bringing and seeing it through Jewish eyes gives us the ability to understand even more deeply what it is that God in his intimate relationship with us is wanting to transmit to us and uh, that we can transfer to others as well. So we're grateful for that and for the opportunity to having this message go forth to the multitudes. We're grateful for that. We have in the back the basket for Hamaser for Turma the tithe, the tenth, and the offering. Uh, you can place that in there. There are envelopes there if you need to fill that out. We also have, uh, for those who are more internet savvy, you can do that on PayPal at bethzion.org or mail in those contributions to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we're grateful for all of your prayers and support and the way that God is knitting us together as a people to be able to have impact in the communities around us. And those communities around us uh, seem to be growing all the time. And I don't know exactly how God is going to involve us in these different growing communities, but we just want to be aware of what we see the Father doing and allow him to 
direct us in a way that makes us responsive to what his intent is. And so we want to see God do beyond what we can ask, think, or imagine. So if you say, well, I don't understand what's going on, so I can't move forward. No, no, you can move forward because we don't have to understand everything. Just understand him and understand and look to him for direction, just like Yeshua displayed when he said, I do what I see the Father doing. And if we can look to the Lord and seek his directive, he'll lead us in ways that we never imagined and bring fruitfulness in ways that we didn't think possible. And so we want to yield ourselves to him in those ways. A couple of quick announcements. First of all, we did put up our sukkah on Friday. We did that yesterday. Uh, Mark was there and uh, Gerson and myself. And so the sukkah is up in place. If you go to the Beth Zion House after service for our Onik Shabbat, uh, you'll see the sukkah up already. And what we're planning to do for those who would like to participate on Monday, have our first day of Sukkot service. And we will be having that at the Beth Zion House at 11 o'clock on Monday morning on the 10th. So uh, if you can join us for that, we'll have our Lulav and Etrog and we'll go through, have a, short, a service and it'll be, uh, it'll be a lot of fun. It's always a lot of fun, especially being outside like that. Not only is it exciting to do that outside, but we have an opportunity to even extend that because it happens that they're having a special event here in this facility next week on the 15th, Saturday the 15th, which is going to be our Sukkot Shabbat service, but we won't be able to meet here. So we are going to set up the white chairs out on our courtyard at Beth Zion House and in front of the sukkah, and we're gonna do our Shabbat service outside next week at the Beth Zion House. If it gets too cold, we can always go inside to do that. But next week, the 15th, we will be at the Beth Zion House for that service. Come on over and uh, it'll be a really celebrative time. Avinu Malkino, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word, to take time to look into the portion this week so that you, by your Ruach, by your Spirit, can speak to us in applications for our lives and for those around us. Pour out your spirit in a special way this day as we yield ourselves to you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Today's portion is called Ha'azinu, which means hear. And it starts off by saying, Hear, O heavens, as I speak. Listen, earth, to the words from my mouth. And it's interesting, too, because this is, if you look at the last verse of last week's portion, uh, chapter 31 of Devarim, Deuteronomy, verse 30, it says, Then Moses spoke in the hearing of the whole assembly of Israel the words of this song from beginning to end. And so this week's portion is a song, a song of Moses. And I put this up because as the title for today's message, A New Country Song by Moshe. And I have there, if you see, there's Moshe on the mountain, and we've got the mic dropped down, and he's got his guitar in hand. And, uh, but I want to look at this in a, in, a, in a little bit of a different light, because why did I put a new country song by Moshe? They were getting ready to go into a new country. They were getting ready to go into a new land, a land that God had promised to our people. But there was also this idea, I thought about this, and, you know, with country songs, with country songs, they're always kind of a mix of sad and happy at the same time. One of my songs that will probably never be on an album, uh, my shortest country song kind of goes like this. It says, we went to the dance together, but left in separate cars. 
That's pretty much the framework of country songs, isn't it? It looks like it's working out and it's sad. Well, you know, in this chapter, what Moses is doing as he's preparing for the people to go into the land of promise, he's letting them know that there are going to be benefits if they follow and there is going to be calamity if they don't. And what he says is kind of interesting. This is sort of, that's why I maybe think of it sort of like a country song because country songs are not only storytelling, but they also are reflective things that make you think about the actions you've taken to get to where you are, to say, this is not where I want it to be, but how do I get out of it? I don't see a way to do it. And then God brings a way. Well, in this case, he talks about this from the beginning. He says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 1, Hear, O heavens, as I speak. Listen, earth, to the words from my mouth. He's starting off by not addressing the people directly, but addressing the heavens and the earth. May my teaching fall like rain. May my speech condense like dew. What is condense like dew? It's, it's that these words would come down and like dew attaches to the blades of grass and the flowers and all those things. And it's sort of like a concentrated um, refreshing that is there for the plants. He's also describing us in that way. He mentioned before in another place that all flesh is like grass. The grass wither, the flower fades. But God has a way of ministering his healing touch to all others, all those who follow him. But look what he says. May my speech condense like dew, like light rain on blades of grass or showers on growing plants. You know, we had the hurricane last week, and that would not be the same kind of a category. Uh, there was not just sh showers on growing plants. Those were deluges that wiped out everything, that washed away plants, that did all of that. So there is this refreshing that he speaks of here. And he says, light rain on blades of grass or showers on growing plants. For I'll proclaim the name of the Lord. Come declare the greatness of our God, the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are just. A trustworthy God who does no wrong. He is righteous and straight. And it's kind of interesting the way this comes up. The reference to the rock happens several times in here. Now, that's not referring to the wrestler who became the actor known as Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> but the rock he's speaking of here is the rock of our salvation, the Lord himself, the rock his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A trustworthy God who does no wrong, he is righteous and straight. And you say, then what has happened to the world around us? He clarifies that as well. The next verse, verse 5, he says, he's not corrupt. The defect is in his children. A crooked and perverted generation. <laughs> I thought again, you know how I am with, with movies. There was that scene where where Doc Brown comes back and he's got that DeLorean now with the Mr. Uh, Mr. Nuclear on the back of it, you know? And, and he says, well, did something go wrong? Not using the words they use there. Something go wrong? He says, no, Marty, it's your kids. The defect is in the children. Now, we might say that if we haven't led our children in a path, but when we sit in the house, walk by the way, lie down, rise up, maybe there is a contributing factor to why the children go astray. But he's describing his people, God's people, as a defect in the children, a crooked and perverted generation. You foolish people so lacking in wisdom. Is this how you repay Hashem? He's your father who made you his. It was he who formed and prepared you. Remember how the old days were? Ah, back for the old days. 
Think of the years through all the ages. Ask your father. He'll tell you. Your leaders, too. They will inform you. When El Elyon gave each nation its heritage, when he divided the human race, he assigned the boundaries of people according to Israel's population. But Hashem's share was his own people. Yaakov, his allotted heritage. It, it is describing a love in this song that expresses how deeply committed God is to his people. And yet in the process of that, she went home in another car. <laughs> she went off with somebody else who had better dance moves maybe. But she looked around and she wasn't looking at him. She was looking for something else. And isn't that what happens in the world around us? We try to find shortcuts. We try to find ways. We try to find things they promise us this is going to work. And even though the track record has been lousy with what they've said before, we say, well, God's always faithful. But you say this is going to work. Uh, it hasn't worked before. I'll tell you what. I'll give you one more try. <laughs> I think, what in the world is that? He has left us flat every time, the adversary. And yet we give him one more try. <laughs> Instead of trusting in the one who, in the midst of not knowing what's going on around us, we begin to question. But he knows exactly what's going on around us and where he is bringing us to. And we need to be able to trust him. And I find it interesting, too. It says he found his people in desert country in a howling, wasted wilderness. He protected him and cared for him, guarded him like the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up her nest, hovering over her young, spreads out her wings, takes them and carries them as she flies. God was wanting to bring them into the world, to bring them into a place of new heights and new places, to get them spreading their wings to be able to experience the new heights of what God was doing. And yet they kept kicking against it. It said, but Yeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, thick, and gross. He abandoned God, his maker. He scorned the rock, his salvation. What is a rock? It's a foundation. We talk about Messiah being the cornerstone. He is the one that everything coming together in a building, a cornerstone, holds it together. It's the place, the corner, where it demonstrates exactly what is the foundation of this building. And with people, Messiah is the foundation for us. He is the cornerstone, the rock of our salvation. And it says... He scorned the rock. Why? Because there are always voices clamoring for attention and wanting to establish different groups to cancel out every other group. If we could keep one thing in mind with all of the news that's out there, with all of the positions that are presented, it almost, I say almost doesn't matter, which side you're on. Now, I'm not condoning things that are abominable in this world. But I will tell you, it almost doesn't matter if we engage in the things we're supposed to engage in and not be sidetracked by all these other things around us. If there's something that is opposed to what you believe, you can have a choice. <laughs> you can dismiss what you're doing to engage in a dialogue or a conflict with people who disagree or a rally with people who do agree. But you know what you are doing when you do that? You're sidestepping what God has called us to do. And there may be a place where we stand in support for some action against something that is happening, an atrocity that is happening. But there is one thing we have to keep in mind. And if we think of this as a song, why was it a song? A song is something that 
keeps going on with the melody and lyrics that keep you informed of the most important elements of that story. And so this was like a song that was given to the people that talked about their rebellious side, that talked about their corrupt side and perverted side, but talked about God's love and compassion side and how he wants to bring about these things. And the one thing about a song is that even if you don't have a book with you to read or something of that order, you begin to sing that melody once again. You begin to rehearse once again on the key elements of what it is that is important in life. And there should always be, with all the voices clamoring for our involvement and attention, we should have that musical sound moving in our hearts, always drawing us back to what is key to it. Now, I don't think that Moses played a guitar or had a mic for recording like we have in this picture here, kind of doctored that a little bit. But when we move, maybe not to a new country, but move into a new place that God is working in our life, there's something unusual about it. There's something that's different. It may be a wilderness experience that feels dry, and we wonder if we made the right decision. And yet, even in the midst of that, he says he found them in a dry country, in a desert land. And in that process, he wanted to establish his position as the solid foundation for our walk. He is the rock. But look what he says also. He says about Jeshurun is a reference to Israel, to the people of God. It says he scorned the rock, his salvation. What about that? He scorned the rock. He did not agree with the rock. Okay, he disagreed. But he scorned his very salvation. His own wholeness was in jeopardy because he didn't understand the power of the rock working in his life. And look at what he says. It may not be just to fight against the rock. To ignore the rock is what it says here. Look what he says. They rouse in verse 16. They roused him to jealousy with alien gods, provoked him with abominations. They sacrificed to demons, non-gods, gods that they had never known. Sort of like God, he's come lately. They just didn't know them. They never heard of them, and here they are serving them, which your ancestors had not feared. You had no fear of them because you didn't know they existed. But these other elements, these other voices came along and seek to seduce us away from a relationship with God, with the rock of our salvation. And look what it says. Verse 18, you ignored the rock who fathered you. You forgot God who gave you birth. It's an amazing thing to look at, but he is constantly wanting to bring us back. Look a little bit further down, and in verse 28, he says this, They are a nation without common sense, utterly lacking discernment, utterly lacking discernment. It's like they move headlong into calamity because they don't recognize. Remember in Proverbs, it talks about a woman of the night who says to a young, innocent traveler, I've prepared my bed. Come, my husband is away. Let's take advantage of this time. And like an animal going to slaughter, he doesn't see what's coming. He says, oh, I think she really likes me. <laughs> and in the meantime, it's, oh, what happened there? Missed the whole thing. There is something about the nation without common sense, utterly lacking in discernment. You know, God wants us to have common sense and the most common sense we could have when we don't know what's going on around us is not to try to shoot from the hip and make it work as best we can, 
but look to the one who does know what's going on around us. The most common sense we could have is to listen to God and not these lying voices that are out there continually spewing out promises that they cannot keep. It's an amazing thing. He says they are a nation without common sense. If they were wise, they could figure it out and understand their destiny. After all, how can one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to rout unless their rock sells them to their enemy, unless Hashem hands them over? Again, now the rock is giving them over to their enemy. Why? Does he not love them anymore? No, because they've chosen to say, I'd like to align with the enemy. Only they don't call it the enemy. They call it the one who said that they're really special. And they don't see what's coming. Like a spear going through their heart. They don't see like a, an animal trapped in a net or caught in a trap. They don't see what's coming. But they get so caught up with what has been promised that they neglect the rock of their salvation. They neglect, we neglect the one who is singing to us a song of love and also having within it the caution in this song. There's positive, there's negative, there's sadness, there's joy. It is like a country song, isn't it? When you look at it this way, he says that this is what is happening. You look down a little bit further and in 31, it says, for our enemies have no rock like our rock. Even they can see that. Rather, their vines are the vine of Sodom and the field of Gomorrah. Their grapes are poisonous. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is snake poison. The cruel venom of vipers. You can't see that because you look at something and it's glistening as wine or it's looking like it's refreshing as berries or grapes, but you don't know that they're poisoned. You don't know what they are. It's sort of like today when they talk about with fentanyl. You don't know. Now they're coloring them, looking like Skittles. They're actually putting them into candy packages. I am scared to know what is going to happen this Halloween if people happen to find a bargain price on Skittles or something else like that, and they give those out to kids, who knows what this will look like? But there are people out there, the ones who create this stuff, and when you look at it, you think how diabolical, how sinister, how disgusting, that there is no, there is not an attempt to send out, oh, like, cocaine or some other drug that they want to acquire new people to get addicted so that they will have an ongoing supply. There is a deliberate attempt to squash and to destroy our kids. 109,000 young people from the ages of, what, 15 to 29 have died in this past year not by overdosing, but by the poison of this product. And now they're trying to package it to look like chalk or to look like candy. It is a horrible thing. And you, you don't hear anything really in the news about them trying to stop it. Coming from China, coming across the border, all of these things. Some of these busts that they make are enough in one bust, <laughs> enough fentanyl to kill everyone in the United States more than once. It is a sickness. We're being attacked in a certain way. And yet everybody is lulled to sleep by a different song that's going on in the world around us. Oh, there's a lot of songs that are out there. 
But the song of Moses is a warning to be able to stick to the rock of our salvation. But those other melodies, those other sounds are saying, you can find pleasure in this. It will be good for you. Come on along and sing the song and join right in. And not know that it's their very life that is in, that's hanging in the balance. It's very sad, but it's kind of interesting that he describes this here as saying they don't understand that their grapes are poisonous, that their clusters are bitter, that their wine is snake poison, cruel venom of vipers, slithering in to take charge of our children and then to destroy them. They're not getting new addicted buyers. They're just killing the kids. You listen to some of these reports and it's one time. They thought they were buying something on the internet that would maybe help them concentrate or sleep. Not knowing that it was something that was laced with fentanyl. One time, gone. No time to address it. No time to deal with it. No time to pump their stomach or anything like that. But you know, when you're dealing with the adversary and you're dealing with sin, the end result of sin is what? Death. Death. And it isn't always the kind of a thing like you see in the movies where they say, all right, I've got you now. All my blades are on you. Oh, the laser is on you. Now, here's what I'm going to do. And as he's explaining to him how he's going to really make it hurt, something happens and the good guy is able to break free, get out, defeat the enemy, and everything goes fine. And you look at these and you think, why do they go into these dialogues when they're ready? They got them right there. It's like you'd say, all right, we got them. Done. <laughs> Done. Now you move forward, right? But there is something where they, the bad guys just have to play it up a little bit. They're doing like the little musical interlude till they put them to death. Only they give them just enough time to wiggle their way out with a lot of the things that are happening today and the accelerated pace of sin that is going on around us, they're bypassing that little musical interlude, if you will. They're going right to killing the children. And you know, in every despotic incident that's happened in the world, it seems like the children are always the focal point. Destroy the children, they said in that movie, Hotel Rwanda, it says, if we destroy their children, our enemy will be gone. Our enemy will be gone. If you can turn the children into killing machines, let them kill off our enemy as well. That's another way. But all of it is destructive and taking those, as, as one said, those minds full of mush and programming them to either be Destroyed or destroyers without a reference to know the credibility of who is dictating to them what to do. Now, you can look at that and say, yeah, but we're not kids. We're not. We know so much more. Do we? Why is it then we become so subject to all these different things around us? Why do we allow ourselves to be sidetracked by all of these other issues that are out there and we want to be the authority in speaking about those things? We've got the insight and we're going to tell you what it is and we're finding those who agree and we're dismissing those who don't. I tell you that there is something diabolical working behind the scenes that's trying to change the song of Moses that's trying to change. As we look in Samuel, there was another one, was another song that's mentioned in, uh, in 2 Samuel, in 2 Samuel 22, where David presented the words of a song and said, Hashem is my rock, 
my fortress and my deliverer, the God who is my rock in whom I find shelter, my shield, the power that saves me, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you have saved me from violence. He is describing in his song the overcoming power of God who is his rock, that he's the one he's depending on. He's the one he's listening to. And he said, death's breakers were closing over me. The floods of Bilial terrified me. The ropes of Sha'al were wrapped around me. The snares of death lay there before me. In my distress, I called my congressman. I complained as much as I could. I lashed out. No, he doesn't say that. In my distress, I called to Hashem. Yes, I called to my God. Out of his temple, he heard my voice and my cry entered his ears. We need to be in a position to keep that soundtrack of his song going on in our hearts. To be able to hear the melody you know, he says, making melody in your heart to the Lord, listening to what it is that God is instructing us to do and following through on that. You know, back in that other passage, let me just see if there was something else here. He said, yes, he said this. He said in verse 36, he says, yes, Hashem will judge his people, taking pity on his servants, when he sees that their strength is gone, that no one is left slave or free. Sounds very troubling. Then he will ask, where are their gods? The rock in whom they trusted. He's now saying, you said you're trusting in something else. Where are they now? That you abandoned me. He says, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and, the, and drank the wine of their drinking off, drink offerings? Let him get up and help you. Let him protect you. See, now that I, yes, I am he, and there is no God beside me, I put to death and I make alive, I wound and I heal. No one saves anyone from my hand. And he says, sing out loud, verse 43. Sing out loud, you nations, about the about his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will render vengeance to his adversaries and make atonement for the land of his people. Verse 47, for this is not a trivial matter for you. On the contrary, it's your life. Through it, you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. It's pretty amazing what God wants to do. But in this song, he's telling them even when they go astray, he's still there as the rock and foundation to draw them back if they will listen and respond to him and set aside those other musical incantations of the adversary trying to draw them away with a melody of lies instead of with the word of truth. Ha'azinu, hear, hear, listen. You know, when you think about it, after the holidays, after the wilderness that we saw Yeshua going through the wilderness experience during the time of these readings, he was out at this point with it and preparing for Sukkot. But he tells them also just a few weeks ago, we looked at Isaiah 61, he described that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to set at liberty those that are bound, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free. He tells us in last week's portion during, Russia, during Yom Kippur, the fast that I have chosen to undo the heavy burdens, to mete out to the needs of those around us. Not forced to mete out the needs, not socially controlled to say and guilted to help others. But when we are walking in union with the Lord, 
our natural tendency should be to reach out to those in need around us. But we don't need to have the government to be the one to demand and collect it for us so that they can do to what they want to support. We need to be able to have that control and that relationship with God at the center of our walk with the Lord so that, yes, when we are following the Lord the way that we're supposed to, we measure out to the poor. We reach out to the hungry. We reach out to those in need of shelter and clothing and all of that. We reach out to do that. But you know, there was a song being sung during the last, what, 80 years, 60 years, whatever it was. And that song was to say, look, you, f you take care of your worship things in, the, in your church and synagogues and let us handle all the social issues. And we thought, gee, up to that point, the believing world, the religious world, were taking care of the needs of people. But somewhere along the way, the melody got changed. And the government said, we'll take care of that. You just go and have your Bible studies and your prayer meetings until we tell you later when you can't. We'll take care of the people. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to tax you so that you can be ministering because you want to help the poor, don't you? There is a guilt that is setting in. There is a element to this that's sort of like it's a song, but it's a dissident sound. It's sort of an, a, a melody that isn't quite ringing right. And yet we keep listening to it and singing that song. We need to look at the song of Moses and recognize the challenges that God was saying to us and also the positive blessings that God wants to bring. I want to just close with something here also in Romans 10. In Romans 10, let's see if I can find this. It's kind of interesting because... In this section, he's talking about in chapter 10, he said the goal, verse 4, at which the Torah aims is Messiah, who offers righteousness to everyone who trusts. He is the rock, isn't he? And he is the one, as we trust him, that he brings righteousness to come in. For Moses writes about the righteous grounded in the Torah, that the person who does these things will attain life through them. And we saw that in Leviticus 18.5. He then goes on to say, do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven? That is to bring Messiah down. Who will descend to Sheol? That is to bring Messiah up from the dead. What then does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Remember when we looked at that passage it was in Deuteronomy 30 this past week. We looked at Deuteronomy 30 where he says, even if you wander to the end of the sky, I will come and get you. I'll go there and get you and bring you back. That's the voice we need to hear. That's the sound and the song that we need to be listening to and rehearsing so that we understand the heart condition that God wants us to know. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. It's sort of ringing true within us and our mouth declaring and singing that song of the Lord. And then he says this in verse, we don't have to read all of this here, but it's all interesting if you want to look at it. He says, you know, also we had read in Isaiah 52, 7, it, it, it's quoted here. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those announcing good news about good things. Announcing good news about good things. When we look at this, it, it was in one of the Haftorah portions just a couple weeks ago when we talked about Isaiah 52. How beautiful are the feet of those who announce good news about good things. He tells us to bring good news. When, I, when, when Yeshua came out of the wilderness, went into the synagogue, he said to them, 
part of the thing was when it said the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he was bringing good news. He was bringing a revelation of the good news that was there for the people. That's the kind of song we need to listen to. The song of heaven. The song of God continually delivering in us a sense of his calling, his love, his compassion. The, the, the problem, verse 16, is that they haven't all paid attention to the good news. He's giving this good news, announcing good news, sending people out. How beautiful. Did you know you have beautiful feet? You have beautiful feet if you're sharing the good news of God's message. As you do, your feet are just beautiful. Why? Because they're carrying you, carrying a message of hope and life, announcing good news about good things instead of it being regurgitating of all of the negative things. Well, looks like the country's going down the tubes. Looks like everything's going bad. Looks like there's nothing we can do. It's a shame, isn't it? Ah, but what can you do? <laughs> well, I blame this one. Well, I blame that one. Well, I blame you. No, I blame you. And then everybody goes around in circles, but blaming somebody is not producing a solution, is it? It's just redirecting more dissident sounds that they claim is a song, but it's not. It's a destructive death toll that's coming, a death knoll or whatever you call it. And then he says, the problem is that they haven't all paid attention to the good news and obeyed it. For Yeshayahu, Isaiah says, Hashem, who has trusted what he has heard from us? So trust comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through a word proclaimed about Messiah. But I say, isn't it rather that they didn't hear? Ha'azinu? They didn't hear? No, they did hear. Their voice has gone out throughout the whole world and the words are going out to the ends of the earth. But I say, isn't it rather that Israel didn't understand? I will provoke you to jealousy over a non-nation, over a nation void of understanding. I will make you angry. Moreover, Yeshayahu boldly says, I was found by those who were not looking for me. I became known to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, God says, all day long I held out my hand to a people who kept disobeying and contradicting. Now that is not simply Jewish people. That's all of humankind not responding to the message of God's love that he is bringing the good news to bring deliverance for all people. All day long, I held out my hand. It's like that passage when he wept over Jerusalem. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to bring you under my wings like a, like a, like a hen over her chicks. And he says, and you would not. You said no. How I wanted to gather you. And you said, not now. You said, I've got other things to do other melodies to listen to, other sounds that are giving me some real direction to destruction. But they don't know that yet, do they? It doesn't help even to tell them that it's to destruction, a destructive end. What we need to be able to do is not even get sidetracked on that note, but to declare the good news of what God says we have through Messiah, the deliverance that is there for all people, whosoever will let him come and experience the wonder and the blessing of the Lord. When we look at these things, he is still, it says in Revelation, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open to me, I will come into him, will sup with him and he with me. You'll sit down for dinner and you'll talk and the good news will be shared and that intimate relationship with him. You know, there's that commercial a dating service says, it's just lunch. <laughs> Have you fasted
from meeting with the Lord for lunch or dinner? Have you kept yourself away from the most vital relationship that we have, that of our relationship with him? Have we supped with him? Have we dined with him? Have we sat there and listened to the voice of God, not only speaking to us, but singing to us? This melody, this message, this song of Moses is not copyright, not copy written by Moshe. But the gist of it is reworked. What's the word we use when you, they redo it? Um, remixed. It's remixed all through history by those who hear that melody from God and listen and respond and share it with those around us. It's a message that keeps coming through. God wanting to bring us into a new country, into a new place, into a new dimension in him, into a new part of our calling, a new phase of our walk with him. And the question is, will we say, I've already got something else I'm listening to? Or will we say, no, I don't like the bass section. <laughs> I don't like all these other elements with it. Or will we listen for the voice of God? Will we listen to what he is bringing to us? And then will we turn around after hearing and share that with others? Be those with beautiful feet, bringing good news to all those around us. Avinu Malkano, our Father and our King, we thank you for all of your promises. We thank you for your gift. We thank you that life has a lot of difficulties in it and sometimes may feel like a country song. But your desire is to bring us to victory and to bring us through every challenge and to bring us to a place of refreshing and of rebuilding the old ruins to raising up the cities desolate and in the past and to restore the years that the locusts have eaten, to restore those things that seemed like they've been devoured. And you are a God who has a track record that can be trusted, that you have a ministry of restoration, a track record of successfully restoring Millions of people, one by one, individually, by our coming into relationship with you. Lord, help us to declare your message of life. And first, to hear and listen to your message of life. And then reflect that message to others. As they're looking for direction in this world, we don't have to point out what's bad. We can just point out what's good and have them draw near. Just like we say, we can't focus on turning off darkness. But if we just allow God to turn on the light, darkness disappears and has no place. Lord, help us to focus in the right way and not get sidetracked or sidestepped or sideswiped by people who are on a different agenda. Lord, help us to focus on your agenda and see you bring deliverance to us, to our families, to our friends, even to our enemies, to bring freedom and deliverance to all who call upon you, to all who call upon you in truth. In the name of the Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Let's all stand. And as Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Yivarecha Chodanai V'yish Marecha Ya'er Adonai Pana V'lecha V'chunecha Yisa Adonai Pana V'lecha V'yosem Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying Amen and Amen. I thought I'd end with a melody, right? We'll greet one another. Shabbat Shalom. Join us afterwards, if you will, at the Beth Zion House for some extended time of fellowship. Pick up some lunch and let's have some schmooze time. And don't forget, on Monday, we're going to have an outdoor service at the Beth Zion House to celebrate the first day of Sukkot with our Lulav and Etrog and all those elements looking for God, the tabernacle among us. So we'll see you in Shul. Shabbat Shalom.